Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's talk. We are the security machine learning team at Elastic, and today we are going to talk to you about how we use our telemetry to inform our roadmaps. We'll start with a quick round of introductions and go from there. I am Apurva, I'm a senior data scientist on the team, and my research mainly deals with using machine learning capabilities in the Elastic stack to deliver solutions to our SIM product. I'm Sam, I'm a principal machine learning engineer on the team. I mostly work on building automation and infrastructure for training our model pipeline, as well as publishing the artifacts when they're done. Hi everyone, my name is Disha Dasgupta. I am a data scientist on the same team and my primary responsibility is leveraging the Elastic Machine Learning capabilities to deliver security solutions. And lastly, I'm Jess Dobner. I'm also a principal machine learning engineer and I'm focused on machine learning operations, which includes automating and optimizing, optimizing our machine training and deployment process. Uh, to begin, I'll provide an overview of Elastic and the specific security solutions that our team builds, which will be followed by an explanation of telemetry. Next, Sam will discuss how we use telemetry data to improve and monitor our machine learning models. Disha will then explain how telemetry, telemetry is incorporated in our customer list artifacts, and a corpo will cover how we use telemetry to understand product adoption and usage. Lastly, Disha will take us home by discussing our product roadmap plans to leverage telemetry, including improving recommendations within our product, as well as how we can use incremental learning in our machine learning pipelines. First, underpinning all of Elastic solutions is the Elastic Stack. You may have previously heard of the Elastic Stack referred to as the ELK Stack, which stands for Elastic Search, Log Stash, and Kibana. Elasticsearch is the core of this stack and is where the data is stored, while Logstash is an ETL tool for ingesting data into Elasticsearch, and Kibana is the front end or user interface uh, used for searching and analyzing data within Elasticsearch. At a high level, Elasticsearch solutions focus on adding search functionality to your websites, uh, your custom developed applications, or in a workplace setting, enabling employees to search through uh, different types of data sources from GitHub to wikis to Google Drive uh, to access documents. Next, our observability solutions focus on enabling engineers and developers to understand how their applications and systems are performing. Um, and this is primarily done through logs and metrics. Uh, next is us, or our domain, Elastic Security, which we'll, dig into in, we'll dive into into more detail. So Elastic Security products include two core products. The first is Endpoint Security, which encompasses detecting and responding to malicious software running on customers' devices, such as laptops, servers, and workstations. Basically, any device that a company has that a user might interact with. Um, and it's important to call it this. This is, this is also called an endpoint. Uh, and it's a term we'll use throughout this presentation. Uh, further, malicious software includes any type of program designed to perform harmful or undesired actions on a system. And these, these types of programs are also known as malware, a common term that we hear in this field. In fact, one of our core machine learning solutions is labeling files on a given endpoint as malicious or benign. Next is SIM, or Security Information Event Management. Uh, a, SIM, a SIM product is used to manage security data, including network, application, and endpoint logs. One of the core features of the Elastic SIM product is its ability to monitor security events and create alerts based on detection rules or machine learning jobs that are constantly sifting through incoming telemetry and event data. In particular, detection rules are a set of heuristics used to create alerts, whereas ML jobs can include a range of technologies from anomaly detections to supervise machine learning models that are scanning these logs and looking for anomalous user behavior and events. In this context, an alert is a single event or multiple events of interest that requires further investigation by a security team. If a security 
analyst determines that the alert is significant and re represents a threat. In other words, it's not a false positive. The alert will become an incident and will be tracked in a case. So like I mentioned, alerts are single events or multiple events of interest. Um, and here what we have, we have what a security analyst would actually look at in the Elastic Sim. Uh, in this case, there are a number of alerts that have been generated from detection rules. So in this case, we're tracking these, we visualize these over time by the specific detection rule that has, that has generated the alerts and it has a level of severity associated with it. So now that you have an, a high level understanding of our security products and the domain that we're working in, let's dig a little bit more into telemetry. So specifically telemetry is the automated collection and transmission of data from a remote device for the purposes of monitoring performance. It generally includes events such as logs, metrics, and traces. Uh, it's also important to realize that security telemetry data is typically unified and is unified and analyzed in a SIM product in the security space. In the example below, the Elastic Endpoint uh, and agent is running on, again, our, our customers, computers or endpoints and detecting and preventing malicious software. In this case, events and metadata from the endpoint are constantly being collected and delivered to elastic search clusters via ETL pipelines executed through Logstash. Once data is in the elastic search cluster, it's indexed and it is then searchable via the UI uh, in Kibana and can be visualized by any, any security analyst. Again, telemetry data supports security monitoring and product analytics. Specifically, two use cases that we'll talk about are malware detection. Uh, and this, again, this is the case where we're trying to identify specific files running on a, a customer's machine and whether they're malicious or benign. So in this case, uh, the SHA to identify the file uh, is of interest as well as you know, where that file exists on the system, any processes that might be associated with it, as well as metadata associated with the operating system and the kernel. Additionally, we'll also talk about SIM product usage. And in this case, we're, we're going to be interested in the number of alerts that customers have created and the number of cases that those alerts have generated. Um, and breaking this down on a customer or cluster level is of interest to us. Okay, it helps if I'm not on mute. I'm gonna talk about model improvements and how we actually label malware. So to give you an overview of how the machine learning pipeline actually works, we get input data from S3, and this includes a couple different kinds of third-party data, as well as some internal metadata, all processed by the data engineering team. We train on a large number of samples, and then we predict on an even larger number. All of that data gets inserted into Elasticsearch, and then we evaluate based on telemetry. Once we release the artifact, the final version of the artifact, we, again, monitor the telemetry to determine how well the model is performing in the real world. So here's an example of what one of those dashboards looks like. Um, it was actually created by the principal data scientist on our team, Andrew Davis, to monitor the true positive and true negative rates of our last few model versions. And this is in Kibana, as Jess was mentioning, we like to use this tool for all of our monitoring. The top left side of this slide also demonstrates what we're talking about when we say true positive and true negative. So a true positive in this case would be something that the model says is malware that is actually malware. True negative would be something that the model says is benign, but is actually not malware. So that's good, we're doing the right thing. We wanna to try to minimize false positives and false negatives. And it's quite interesting, you can notice, I was just looking at this data today and observing that the true negative rates are more stable than the true positive rates. and that turns out to be because there are so many near duplicates submitted to VirusTotal, which is this third party service that monitors malware. Um, so we can tell 
that we actually are able to detect this fluctuation during the day because we have this event by event telemetry monitoring on how our model is performing again in the real world on actual customers machines. And this is just another dashboard just to show a bunch of other charts that we like to look at. For example, when we initially release a new version of a model, we monitor it in diagnostic mode, which this top right chart is showing in green. And then depending on how that looks, we might decide the model's ready, we would release it in production mode, which would be the blue lines there. And typically we're gonna set our threshold such that we collect as much data as possible in diagnostic mode, and we wanna reduce any background noise and only detect really important things in production mode. In the real world, we do wanna know if there are large spikes um, and things that, that might indicate something is wrong. So one of the ways that we do this is by setting up Slack alerts from Kibana using the machine learning model for anomaly detection that runs in a product called Stack ML that Elastic provides. So this is just an example of what one of those alerts looks like, where it might tell us, hey, there's too many alerts coming in from your diagnostic model. So then on the next slide, you can see the dashboard that pops up where you can actually view where there was a spike as well as dig deeper into how much higher was the signal for this particular sample, for example. Um, and then we can even dig down all the way to what file was causing this large spike, which is really great because it tells us that something might possibly be wrong with one of our artifacts. And in the future, as we're starting to improve all of our automation around this, we've been rewriting the process that determines how we label what's malware for our model training. So we have a system that pulls in data from third-party services like VirusTotal and Reversing Labs. This is the stuff I mentioned that gets processed by the data engineering team upstream from us. And we pull that data into a set of logic, essentially, that strips out using heuristics um, important fields that we know tend to correlate with things that we know are malware or not. And in the future, we're gonna be incorporating more telemetry into this process. So we'll have not just third-party data, but more of our own internal observations from our actual customers to make sure that we can continue to improve how we label samples and how we train the model. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, something we call lists. So as Sam mentioned, you know, there's a, a lot of work that's done into ensuring our model is as good as it can be. There's a lot of people behind that to make that happen. Um, it's pretty good, but alas, not every model is exactly perfect. So another kind of backup method we use to help provide our solution to our customers is our list. And the idea is, um, as, the, as part of the security solution, uh, things we want to either block against or make sure don't get blocked. You know, if a customer says don't block this or something like that, we provide uh, a list to say, hey, we don't wanna see this ever, or we do wanna see this, make sure it's always kind of there. So with that, we have an initial list. We call this the diagnostic or kind of the first run kind of list. And with that, we have our list and we take telemetry alerts and we use that to define and scope out the production list we end up shipping out to customers. And the reason that this telemetry is so important, you might be thinking, okay, you have training data, you have things to work with. The reason this telemetry is so important is because it's the only way to get real time, not training, not synthetic data that is applicable to our customers directly. And it le we can leverage that to provide the best production list at the end as kind of a, a sidestep to our uh, model too. Uh, with that, I will hand it off to Porva to talk about another really cool uh, telemetry usage. Thank you, Tisha. Um, I'm gonna talk about another type of telemetry that we look at and use, which is called product usage telemetry. Um, next slide, please. As you saw in a previous slide, product usage telemetry is all about how our users are using our products and features. And usage is measured in terms of 
a number of things like counts, whether or not users took certain actions or even time-related metrics. And there's a whole world of product usage metrics out there. And I'll touch upon how to choose your telemetry metrics. But before that, let's take a step back and try and understand why is it so important to measure these metrics. So the advantages of tracking uh, telemetry metrics are at least twofold. First, they can help us validate hypotheses that you might have about the product. For example, if you have a reason to believe that the usage of a particular aspect of your product is low, telemetry can help you quantify and validate this hunch. And once you've validated your hypothesis, you can then do some qualitative studies to understand where exactly the gaps lie and figure out how, how best to bridge these gaps, either by improving existing features or even developing new features. And you can see how this makes for a pretty solid design process because it lets you measure exactly how your changes are impacting the product. And it also helps when you have the right data backing you while you're proposing changes to features or proposing new features altogether. Now there's a ton of metrics out there, so it can get tricky to decide what metrics you want. A few years ago, Google came up with a framework called Heart to measure user metrics in web applications. And this uh, framework categorizes metrics into five main buckets, happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task efficiency and effectiveness. Not all of these metrics are suitable for telemetry data. For example, happiness is um, sort of an abstract concept. Also, not all these metrics might apply to your product. So then uh, that begs the question, how do you choose? What really helps when it comes to uh, deciding what telemetry metrics to track is your key performance indicators or what are your organization's goals? What are your stakeholders uh, actually care, caring about? So let's take the example of our security product, right? We have three main KPIs. We want to reduce the mean time to uh, detect an attack. We want to reduce the mean time to respond. And we want to reduce the time taken by our customers to derive value from our product. With those goals in mind, it becomes a bit easier to decide which hard category I should look at for metrics to track. So in this case, since we care about time to detect and respond, we want to look at task efficiency metrics. For example, I've chosen something called a completion rate, which is the time to complete a certain critical task in the security app, and also productivity. So things like uh, number of alerts triaged in a day, we also probably want to um, see what features users are using the most so we can decide which features to focus on. Um, so probably some engagement metrics there as well. Um, an example of this is measuring actual individual feature usage in the security product. Before we wrap this, um, this topic up, let's quickly take a look at the sources of our telemetry metrics. We have two main sources. One is cluster telemetry, which tracks individual cluster metrics, such as number of alerts triaged, number of cases created. These are a good fit for the productivity metrics that I was talking about. Then there's also something called full story that we use, which helps us segment users, track user journeys, and do more detailed funnel analysis. For example, I can find out uh, where in the process of creating a custom machine learning job alert are users dropping off or what percentage of users are dropping off. It also further allows us to do some initial research around why this might be happening using screen captures. There's also other tools out there like um, Google Analytics, Pendo, and so on, but we use full story. Um, next slide. Yeah, we've only recently started uh, incorporating telemetry into our processes and we know we have a long way to go. So we also wanted to leave you with some of our ideas for future work. One of the things we wanted to do in the future is to introduce the concept of recommendations into the security app. So things like recommending rules for users to enable based on uh, rules that 
they may have enabled in the past or rules enabled by users similar to the user in question or recommending things like what alerts to prioritize. And naturally the goal here is to uh, is for our users to interact with these recommendations by either accepting or dismissing them. And if we can track these user actions, we can incorporate the user feedback into our models to tailor our recommendations better. For example, if we see that uh, a user tends to dismiss certain types of rules, then we might consider downgrading these rules in our recommendation model. And um, with that, I guess I'll hand it off to Disha again to highlight more of our future plans. Thanks, Apoorva. So Apoorva mentioned one cool kind of future roadmap use case. I wanted to talk about another, and that is specifically incremental or continuous learning. So kind of tying that back into, you know, the model process that Sam and I have kind of talked about before. One of the ways that we can do this specifically is with uh, incremental learning and kind of tailoring to some of those false positives. Not that we have too many, but uh, we still want to kind of make sure we are hitting those. So like we mentioned before, we have our initial training model. That was a lot of what Sam had talked about. Uh, a cool use case we've been thinking of is kind of mitigating some of those false positives by taking in telemetry from our customers or those real-time telemetry, having sort of a, a separate model that is telemetry-centric. It is focused on what uh, telemetry we've pulled in solely. And that's important because these are data points not in our original training set, and there really is no other way of generating this data. And using that telemetry, kind of focusing on that telemetry, we can update uh, different samples, different things we see, alerts we see based on other similar alerts. And that can help, we can use that to leverage um, our model even further beyond its good performance. And with that, that is kind of the end of our future roadmap. And I want to take a quick second to um, acknowledge uh, some very important people. The rest of our team uh, on the security and machine learning team, as well as the security data engineering team, and the user experience research team at Elastic, they've all been really helpful and very important to a lot of the solutions we've mentioned today and the future ones for sure. And with that, thank you so much. Okay, I won't click to my thank you slide, but thank you. <laughs> and uh, we'll take any questions now. <laughs>